in this PowerPoint presentation today, what I would like to do is talk a little bit more about the ways in which the Japanese occupation of uh, Southeast Asia went, uh, talk about what the Japanese attempted to do, the way they attempted to frame it, um, and also talk about the sort of complicated relationships that the Japanese had with some of the uh, uh, people uh, in this region, uh, especially indigenous people, not the colonial regimes that had governed places like India and Indonesia uh, and uh, the Philippines, uh, but rather the actual uh, uh, people indigenous to that area themselves. <clears throat> One of the first things I think we need to remember is that in some ways this is a war not just of Japan against European empires in Asia, but that Japan itself uh, was an empire, saw itself as an empire, had already uh, established control over Korea, large parts of China, uh, uh, Taiwan, or what's now Taiwan, uh, by uh, the time the war starts in Southeast Asia in late 1941. Uh, so one of the things that the Japanese in their foundation of what they will call the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, the G-E-A-C-O-P-S, if that makes it any easier, which I don't think it does, that the Japanese were on the one hand seeking to extend empire. They believe firmly uh, in the importance of colonies for uh, the continued prosperity and survival of Japan. But they also had to tread kind of carefully because they were, uh, they did not want to be seen as simply replacing European empires, British, French, Dutch, uh, whatever you have, um, uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, that is, they had to uh, create an idea or a, uh, uh, an image of themselves as liberators, uh, as people who were uh, concerned with what they called pan-Asian freedom. So one of the things that the Japanese uh, uh, did from the start and that you can see uh, illustrated here from this Japanese poster from um, Occupied uh, uh, Vietnam uh, was the Japanese sought to portray themselves as coming and sort of uh, providing a balance between Japanese uh, Vietnamese and even uh, European interests in what had been called French Indochina. So for the Japanese, the first challenge was to try to convince people that uh, they were there as liberators. They were there to allow uh, places to fulfill a particular destiny uh, and that um, the, the Japanese were there as an act or, or in an act of uh, real pan-Asian solidarity. One of the things that the Japanese sought to do was to establish themselves, again, as liberators. Uh, in uh, this uh, depiction here of uh, the Japanese in the Philippines in 1943, um, the Japanese basically argued that they had arrived in order to give Philippines or to grant the Philippines uh, complete and total independence so there would no longer be a sort of dependent territory of the United States, which it had been since 1935. The um, uh, the Japanese oftentimes uh, uh, promised this sort of independence, uh, but as we'll talk about, it was at times much more difficult for them to uh, deliver it uh, and to maintain uh, both this sort of pretense of uh, being there as colonial liberators while well at the same time establishing the sort of economic and political systems they needed to make these colonies, in essence, support the larger Japanese empire. This is another example of Japanese propaganda. This is a leaflet that was dropped to uh, Indian soldiers fighting in the British Indian Army uh, in 1942. 43 uh, and 1944 uh, when they encountered the Japanese in um, parts of uh, Burma <clears throat> uh, and when the Japanese in 1944 decided to mount what was ultimately a, a catastrophic uh, effort uh, to invade parts of northeastern India. Uh, but again, the notion of uh, freeing places uh, for the, the Japanese this was part of the dynamic. That is, they understood that there were people and groups in these various European colonies 
uh, that were potentially amenable to uh, this Japanese uh, arrival uh, and saw it in some ways as aiding in uh, you know, bringing about the end of European colonial rule. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit in the next couple of slides about some of the um, uh, people and groups uh, that the Japanese encountered and with whom they worked, or at least tried to work, uh, for a little while in the 1940s. This is a picture of a Burmese politician named Aung San. Aung San in the 1930s had been very much caught up in uh, the small but uh, growing Burmese uh, nationalist or Burmese independence uh, movement. At the start of the war with Japan, um, he had organized some of his followers into what he called the Burmese Independence Army. Uh, and at least for the first couple of years of Japanese occupation of Burma, uh, Aung San supported uh, the Japanese, uh, worked with them, uh, but by about late 1943, early 1944, uh, had begun to have doubts about just how, uh, first of all, how sympathetic the Japanese were to uh, Burmese nationhood, uh, but also uh, Aung San, uh, who understood sort of the way in which uh, the war was going, began to rethink uh, what a sort of um, uh, an association with the Japanese might mean for the future uh, of Burma going forward. Uh, and from 1944 on, actually allied himself with the British, uh, who had begun in the middle of 1944 to push southward back into Burma to reclaim uh, colonial territory that they had lost in 1942. Um, Aung San uh, was uh, uh, basically placed in charge of Burma uh, in 1945-46 by the British. Um, however, he died in 1947. He was assassinated uh, by one of his um, uh, political rivals. Uh, his daughter, Aung San Suu Kyi, is currently uh, the prime minister uh, of Burma, uh, having been under house arrest for uh, a lot of the last uh, couple decades. Uh, but this is one example of a, uh, a nationalist group that saw the Japanese, at least initially, as um, uh, helpful to their cause, uh, but then turned on the Japanese largely based on what they saw uh, as sort of, you know, uh, Japan's inability to win this war. And so you have some sort of uh, very uh, sort of deliberate political and pragmatic thinking going on here uh, by someone like Aung San. For the British, one of the things that was interesting was that uh, although Aung San had gone uh, with the Japanese in 1942, uh, his return or his efforts to sort of seek out some sort of uh, uh, alliance or cooperation with the British in 1944 actually was fairly well received. That is, the British government uh, understood that if it wanted to remove Japan and then figure out whatever sort of role it would have in um, uh, post-war Asia, uh, the British would need any sort of allies they could get. And so for Aung San to go back to the British uh, and be welcomed and, in fact, sort of, you know, be... Uh, employed by the British for the next couple of years was an indication that the British themselves were trying to uh, negotiate this kind of complicated colonial and potentially post-colonial world. That's one of the things that's very interesting about the way in which this process worked in Asia that differentiated this theater, for example, from Europe. Uh, there was not a lot of ability by uh, European powers to uh, establish, or to su at least successfully establish intelligence networks, uh, networks of uh, uh, special operations uh, troops into many of these occupied Asian countries. Uh, there simply uh, weren't the troops, there were, was not the ability to um, uh, introduce people into uh, crowded urban areas very easily. Uh, there were some efforts to uh, introduce some British, specifically British special uh, operations forces. They called it the Special Operations Executive, SOE. Uh, these forces were introduced into places like Malaysia uh, and Burma, uh, but there was not a lot of contact once they were introduced. In fact, the British 
uh, sent someone into Burma in 1943 and actually, uh, excuse me, someone into Malaysia in 1943 and didn't actually reestablish contact with them until the war was almost over in 1945. Uh, so you have, again, this, this relationship uh, between the colonizer and the colonized that's kind of shifting. Uh, as uh, someone like uh, Aung San realized that the Japanese were not necessarily going to fulfill uh, Burmese uh, nationalists' ideas, uh, and he sought to sort of reposition Burmese nationalism so that it might uh, work with Britain and then take advantage of that cooperation after the war was over. This is a picture of a man who became the uh, president of Indonesia uh, in uh, at the end of the 1940s uh, and continued in that way for a couple of decades, uh, known by one name, as, as several Indonesian politicians uh, have been, uh, this is Sukarno, uh, someone who in the late 1920s had been an activist for Indonesian independence from Dutch rule. Uh, he had spent part of the 1930s imprisoned by the Dutch, and in fact, when the Japanese uh, invaded uh, Dutch Indonesia, in early 1942, Sukarno again uh, was imprisoned. Uh, the Dutch had hoped to send him to Australia, actually, but this, the swiftness of the Japanese attack prevented him uh, from doing that. Um, the Japanese, uh, this was uh, part of sort of their pre-war intelligence, the Japanese had gathered files and information on uh, a whole bunch of Asian nationalist movements. Um, we saw that they... Uh, uh, were able to establish contact with Aung San and the Burmese independence movement. A similar thing went on with Sukarno. Sukarno was basically asked by the Japanese uh, to become sort of a public face of the Japanese occupation, to encourage Indonesians to uh, participate in and to support uh, Japanese rule with the idea that eventually a Japanese, uh, eventually, excuse me, that the, with eventually uh, the result that Indonesia would gain its independence. Um, Sukarno agreed to do this. Uh, Sukarno, um, uh, in particular, was asked by the Japanese to encourage uh, uh, Indonesians uh, to work for the Japanese, uh, to uh, contribute food to the Japanese uh, war effort. Um, uh, Sukarno uh, traveled to Japan, where he was uh, presented to the emperor as uh, other colonial nationalists were uh, as a way of sort of demonstrating that uh, they uh, appreciated what was going on in Japan or appreciated Japanese influence in Indonesia. Um, at the end of the war, uh, Sukarno, who had never been a, um, a really sort of uh, in contact with the Dutch uh, during the war, uh, Sukarno, rather than waiting to see what European forces were going to be coming back into Indonesia, uh, Sukarno himself declared Indonesian independence just after the Japanese surrender in the late summer of 1945. Uh, one of their, uh, and he um, uh, was able to create an army, uh, uh, one that was waiting by the time uh, Allied troops began coming to Indonesia in September and October 1945. Uh, in fact, Sukarno was uh, condemned as a collaborator uh, and a, a Japanese ally by uh, the British, the United States, and the Dutch. Uh, the, uh, the British uh, and eventually the Dutch sent troops to Indonesia to try to put down uh, this war. Uh, they are not able, ultimately, to contain it successfully. Uh, but uh, Sukarno had sort of an interesting career. Uh, at the end of the 1940s, Sukarno actually manages to sort of uh, uh, to end the conflict with the Dutch and with the Americans by basically positioning himself within the growing Cold War context. One of the things that Sukarno does is Sukarno uh, uh, makes it explicit uh, that his Indonesian independence movement is not a communist movement. Uh, Ironically, within a decade or so, he'll start espousing uh, at least some communist or socialist principles for Indonesia. But at least at the end of the 1940s, Sukarno makes the point that he has, in essence, purged pro-communist uh, uh, people from positions uh, around him and that this Indonesian independence movement is not going to be uh, one that's simply going to sort of fall in line with whatever, uh, for example, the Soviet Union uh, might wish them to do. Um, 
that means ultimately that the Americans uh, uh, who are supporting the Dutch and the British and others uh, in trying to keep down the Indonesian independence movement, they ultimately back off. Um, and uh, from 1949 on, uh, uh, Sukarno and Indonesia are on their own. Uh, so here you have a, um, uh, an independence leader who worked with the Japanese. He later expressed some um, regrets, especially over the role he played in encouraging uh, and recruiting uh, uh, labor from Indonesia uh, to work for the Japanese. Uh, but it was someone who, uh, again, like Aung San, was sort of trying to play the odds. Uh, but with a real vacuum of authority at the end of the war, felt that he could declare uh, an Indonesian independence. One thing that's very interesting about the end of the war in Asia, especially in Southeast Asia, is that the Japanese had several million troops spread out all over Southeast Asia, including China. Uh, they had to keep at least a million troops in China at all time to basically uh, maintain control there. But the, um, the war ends, of course, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and it ends with large numbers of Japanese troops not necessarily surrendering to or even seeing allied forces. That is, in Singapore, in Malaysia, in Indonesia uh, in particular, uh, there had been no invasion of these territories that ended the war. Rather, Japanese garrisons there had been told from Tokyo to surrender in the middle of August uh, 1945. Uh, and Indonesia was a case like that, where the Japanese army in Indonesia had been instructed to surrender, but the question was, who exactly do you surrender to? Uh, it wasn't until British troops began arriving in the start of September that there was actually someone or some entity uh, to whom the Japanese could surrender. So one of the things that Sukarno did uh, was to take advantage of this kind of um, uh, moment in between uh, the end of the Japanese Empire and an attempt by the Dutch and others to reestablish European control. Perhaps the most famous of these colonial nationalists that allied themselves uh, with the Japanese in the Second World War, uh, was a group that came to be known as the Indian National Army, or INA, led by a man named Subhas Chandra Bose. And the emergence of this particular uh, group uh, is something that's been fairly sort of uh, uh, well recognized in the history of the war. Uh, but what's interesting is that uh, Bose and those who led the INA have, in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, become much more recognized in India itself. Uh, that is, that Bose has been seen as someone uh, of almost sort of equal stature to uh, Mohandas Gandhi in uh, pers the pursuit of uh, Indian independence from the British Empire. So if a little bit of backstory on Bose, and then we'll talk about the Indian National Army uh, a little bit. <clears throat> Subhas Chandra Bose was from the city of Calcutta in northeastern India, uh, he was uh, educated in both India and in Britain. He was someone who came from a fairly prominent uh, political family. He was someone who also, in the 1930s, as a member of the Indian National Congress, he was someone who disagreed with Gandhi, who argued uh, that simply using civil disobedience and nonviolent resistance was not perhaps the only way to remove Britain from India. Uh, he was jailed several times. <clears throat> he eventually left uh, uh, or sort of broke off his relationship with Gandhi and the Indian National Congress. Um, <clears throat> when the war started in 1939, he was arrested by the British and uh, imprisoned uh, as basically as uh, someone seen as, you know, sort of a potential uh, uh, subversive or uh, someone who might uh, try to sabotage the war effort in India. He was released from prison uh, after having an operation and was recovering at home, and from there he escaped, uh, ultimately uh, moving north through um, Afghanistan in 1940 to winding up, first of all, in Moscow, where Stalin didn't quite know what to make of him, um, <clears throat> and then he made his way to Berlin in, uh, at the end of 1940, uh, where he did have a chance to meet with uh, Hitler and other members uh, of the Nazi regime, uh, Bose proposed to put together a legion of captured Indian troops, that is, people who had been fighting for the British Army uh, 
in the Battle for France in the spring of 1940, uh, who had been captured, um, and uh, <coughs> he, he proposed to turn them into a pro-German uh, regiment. Uh, he was able to find a couple of thousand Indians uh, who were uh, willing to go along with this, um, but the the Nazi regime didn't really know what to do with him either. Um, <coughs> they allowed him to, to form what became known as the Freihind Corps, or the Free or Independent Indian uh, Corps. Uh, <coughs> but they viewed him also as uh, someone who's, uh, whose presence kind of got in the way, and uh, that they had no desire to have Indians necessarily fighting on the side uh, of Germans. Uh, near the end of 1941, they actually moved him to Japan. He was taken by a German submarine that rendezvoused with a Japanese submarine, uh, and uh, he was uh, brought to Tokyo, and then he came to Singapore. About a year after the fall of Singapore, uh, Bose came to Singapore to take control of a group that the Japanese had been trying to put together. <coughs> The Japanese had found, after the surrender of Malaysia and Singapore and Burma, the Japanese had found that they had a significant number of Indian soldiers as POWs. Uh, they probably had close to uh, 100,000. And uh, the, um, <clears throat> the result of this was that some in Japan argued that, that rather than waiting for some sort of group to form organically within India or something like that, as it happened in Burma under um, uh, uh, Aung San, uh, that instead Japan ought to sponsor an Indian group that would, in essence, fight alongside the Japanese, so that it would serve as sort of a big propaganda victory for the Japanese uh, in uh, uh, their sort of in their fight with Britain, especially. <coughs> Bose was seen as someone who could take charge of that. And so Bose comes back to Singa comes to Singapore in 1943 and begins to put together the INA or Indian National Army. Uh, this picture of him here is uh, here is is of him uh, marching with a woman who was the commander of uh, a smaller group within the INA, uh, which was an all women's uh, organization. Uh, but Bose and the Japanese were able to recruit something around 40,000. <coughs> Uh, Indians or people of Indian descent to fight for the Indian National Army. About half of their recruits came from uh, people who were POWs. Another, the other half came from people of Indian descent who had been living in places like Burma and Malaysia and Singapore <coughs> before the war began. The idea was that this group would serve again to uh, fight alongside the Japanese and to to. Uh, you to, to allow the Japanese to portray themselves as sort of, you know, again, allies of uh, nationalists. The INA did not actually do very much. The Japanese pressed for all sorts of materials and funding uh, as the war drew on. The Japanese didn't do much to provide uh, bows and the INA with material. Uh, they did uh, use them to fight. Uh, especially in the Japanese invasion of India of 1944, <clears throat> but they were not given uh, a lot of supplies. They were not fully supported. They were oftentimes sort of left out on what might almost be seen as uh, suicide missions, and large numbers of them were either killed or surrendered uh, to uh, British or Indian forces uh, in uh, 1944 and early 1945. <clears throat> the INA, well, it had a little bit of public relations value then, didn't have any sort of material impact on the war. <clears throat> Perhaps the biggest impact it had, though, was that it created the image of Indians not just protesting and uh, using Gandhian nonviolence as a way to get uh, independence, uh, but also Indians actively taking up arms to gain uh, independence. The, um, uh, the INA uh, argued, or the INA <coughs> was, according to Bose, uh, an independent national army, uh, that its uh, behavior was governed by the laws of war uh, and uh, international law, just the way in which other armies were. Uh, at the end of the war, uh, Bose himself dies in a plane crash on Formosa, that is Taiwan, uh, and uh, the rest of the INA, uh, especially the Indian officers who had joined it, uh, surrender. 
in the early fall, in September of 1945, the British hold a trial in the middle of New Delhi of three selected officers from the Indian Army, people who had been POWs and then joined the INA, uh, as a sort of show trial to demonstrate how uh, much the British were going to crack down on this behavior. Uh, and what historians of Indian independence uh, say is that this moment, this attempt to put the INA on trial, is one that represents a huge turning point for India's relationship with Britain. <clears throat> because when they were put on trial, it was a court martial. They were accused of um, deserting their posts, of uh, conspiring against um, people who had stayed with the British Indian Army, uh, all sorts of things. They were convicted on all counts <clears throat> but were, and were uh, going to be sentenced to life in prison. But they were then immediately released because their trial had become this huge cause within India. Uh, lots of prominent Indian politicians who were lawyers had rushed to defend them. Uh, there had been mass protests in New Delhi. There had been all sorts of publications about this. And what this brought home to the British government was, in particular was that India might no longer be governable. That if Britain wanted to hold on to India, there was going to be a lot of resistance to it based on the amount of support given to these guys. Uh, and that Britain, at the end of World War II, had neither the sort of political will nor the economic ability to fight another war, especially a drawn out sort of um, uh, counterinsurgency uh, in India. So the, the INA, its existence didn't do much to change the course of the war itself, but its existence or its, the debate over its existence after the war really served to push the British along. And this is one of many reasons uh, why many in India today uh, have argued that not for the replacement of Gandhi, but uh, as a sort of national icon in the Indian freedom struggle, uh, but rather the, the now the inclusion of Bose, who uh, uh, was someone who by, in essence, actually taking it to uh, the British, however ineffective the uh, INA was, uh, did manage to give Indian people a sense uh, that uh, they were fighting against Britain. Wasn't necessarily fighting for Japan, uh, and the whole idea of sort of fighting with Japan was glossed over and, and reduced, but today if you visit many Indian cities, um, oftentimes you have statues of bows in important places in the cities. Uh, usually a statue that has been uh, installed in the last 20 or, or 30 years. Uh, as I said, Bose, uh, Bose himself dies uh, in August 1945, trying to get away from uh, Taiwan. He dies in a plane crash. Um, and for a long time, the Indian National Army's existence was only sort of acknowledged by the government of India. In the last 10 to 20 years, though, as I've said, people, more and more people have begun to embrace it uh, and to see uh, the Indian Nationalist uh, Army as sort of uh, a step beyond Gandhi and an expression uh, that at least some Indians were willing uh, both to fight and uh, to die uh, in the service uh, of getting an independent state. Despite the rhetoric that the Japanese had coming in to these various places, these former colonies, about being liberators, there were some things that fairly quickly convinced a lot of the occupants of these places, um, that the Japanese were not necessarily there as, uh, you might say, sort of uh, allies, but rather were there as sort of uh, a new type of colonial ruler. <clears throat> uh, there were a couple of, of, of things that stand out uh, in particular. Um, the first is that uh, the Japanese occupation uh, of China in the um, uh, late 1930s, had been very violent. That is, things like the uh, massive attacks uh, on uh, populations in Nanjing and Shanghai uh, had indicated uh, sort of deep down the ways in which the Japanese thought about uh, Chinese people uh, uh, as a whole. Um, this illustration from 1938, uh, entitled Devil Behind the Mask, this is a Japanese cartoon uh, that shows the way in which Japanese propaganda attempted to portray Chinese people as 
sort of um, hiding behind a mask of civility or friendliness or um, uh, sort of uh, not being uh, uh, harm harmful or something like that, <clears throat> when instead they were uh, apparently devious and plotting and uh, uh, closer to savage. This is the um, uh, part of the sort of undercurrent that runs through the Japanese occupation. Uh, and it, it expresses itself in two ways I'm going to talk about. It. I'm going to talk about one in terms of sort of violence against uh, non-Japanese people, and I'm going to talk the second about the way in which Japanese forced labor works. But the, the unifying thread here is the Japanese belief that the rest of Asia was in some senses uh, destined to serve them, uh, and that while they might use a lot of rhetoric about independence, um, what is interesting is that the Japanese really only turned to concrete ideas about helping these colonies become independent only in 1943 and 1944 as pressure on the Japanese empire grew and as the need to maintain um, indigenous people as allies or at least as you know sort of compliant in Japanese occupation uh, increased. What you have here, again, this, this message that the, the Chinese are, you know, sort of uh, hiding behind something or hiding behind uh, appearances. And this becomes quite evident in uh, the first months of Japanese occupation, really the first place that, that uh, falls under complete Japanese control uh, in early 1942, and that's Singapore. And I'll explain more about that in the next slide. When the Japanese conquered Singapore, they took over an island city-state that had a pretty diverse population. Uh, people from uh, Malaysia, uh, Europeans, um, uh, people uh, of Indian descent, uh, and also a really large population of what were called the overseas Chinese. Uh, these Chinese, or this Chinese population, was seen by the Japanese as an immediate threat to Japanese control. The, the Chinese, uh, would uh, resent the Japanese based on Japanese occupation of China already, um, and that the overseas Chinese represented sort of a powerful economic and social and even sort of political group uh, with connections uh, around Southeast Asia. That is, there were Chinese populations in many, you know, ranging from Calcutta in India all the way uh, uh, through Burma, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, even in the Philippines, um, Chinese migrant labor, Chinese uh, uh, traders had all spread out over the previous uh, century or so uh, that it, it seemed to the Japanese that this represented a sort of viable threat to them. Um, there's also the, the fact that at least some of the, uh, these overseas Chinese uh, had some sympathy for the Chinese Communist Party. The Chinese Communist Party in the late 30s and early 1940s having been sort of sent into exile by the Chinese government before the war with Japan, uh, winds up, uh, in starting in the early 1940s, winds up uh, uh, becoming a, a more significant actor in China uh, as the Chinese Communist Party leads raids and sabotage uh, uh, on uh, a variety of Japanese positions and Japanese uh, uh, railway uh, lines and food stores and things like that. So it's it's... The overseas Chinese population was seen by the Japanese as a source of potential disaffection and even damage uh, once the uh, occupation uh, uh, was established. And the, the, the Chinese population seemed to be most concentrated in um, Singapore. In other parts of, the, um, uh, of Burma and Southeast Asia, the, the, the Japanese did single out Chinese for imprisonment and even um, uh, execution, but nothing matches the scale of what happens in Singapore between the end of February and May 1942, when what takes place is called the Suk Ching Massacre. Uh, Suk Ching uh, was what the Japanese called it. It, it, means, it means purification by cleansing. Uh, and what the Japanese did was they basically screened and set up to interview and to classify every Chinese male in Singapore, or every Chinese man in Singapore, between the ages of 18 and 50 to determine whether they were a threat or not. Oftentimes, uh, they would determine if someone was a threat based on their, um, uh, their income, 
their level of education, their, uh, their work history, their participation in a trade union movement, anything like that. Uh, the result was, no one's exactly sure on the numbers, but over that two-month period or so, the Japanese killed at least 20,000 and maybe as many as 40,000 Singapore Chinese men. Uh, they were buried in uh, mass graves around, um, uh, around the city, uh, and it was designed to serve not only uh, as a way of eliminating what was seen as a, a potential sort of uh, potentially disaffected population, but also it was seen as a way of sending a message to any others who would um, potentially think about uh, opposing Japanese rule there. This is the small memorial that's been erected in the center of Singapore. A lot of Singapore uh, was destroyed during the war and rebuilt afterwards, and uh, a lot of the colonial structures that were there before the war no longer exist. Uh, this uh, sort of small memorial uh, contains a map, like the one on the previous slide, showing the site of these mass graves. Um, a lot of these mass graves were uncovered after the war and formed part of the evidence uh, against um, uh, Japanese uh, military officials in Singapore. Um, uh, at their war crimes uh, tr trials at the end of uh, uh, at the end of the conflict, uh, but again, it's a um, uh, a reminder uh, that for the Japanese, this was about rule and it was about the maintenance of power. It wasn't necessarily about creating a system of independent nation states around Asia who would look to Japan uh, as for sort of for guidance or something like that, uh, but rather it was about ensuring uh, direct Japanese imperial control. The Japanese also massacred uh, some European civilians and allied soldiers in several locations in, in Singapore as uh, the uh, conquest of this city was coming to a close. Uh, this includes the, the place commemorated here, the Alexandra Hospital. Um, one of the things that we'll, we'll be turning to consider now is the way in which Japan not only uh, sought to eliminate groups that they saw as undesirable, uh, but also the ways in which the Japanese sought to um, uh, incorporate or to basically uh, force labor participation uh, from throughout this uh, empire. Uh, and uh, in particular, some of the measures they put in place to move uh, lots of Asians around within this expanding Japanese empire uh, to build things like, for example, the railway that would connect Burma and Thailand that allow uh, for an easier movement of things like rice from Burma uh, out to other parts of the Japanese empire. Uh, so we will um, uh, talk about that in a moment. One thing I do want to mention here when I look at this uh, commemoration of the Alexandra Hospital uh, massacre is that the Japanese also took a very specific approach to um, Europeans, especially uh, soldiers of European descent uh, who had surrendered, uh, POWs. Uh, that is that in surrendering, these POWs were seen as having sort of forfeited a lot of their rights, a lot of their sort of, you know, uh, claims to be, uh, you know, sort of claims to equality as, as human beings. And there's a lot of debate about why the Japanese military stressed this idea that surrender was uh, something that uh, a soldier uh, did not do, that it was not in character, that it was not morally correct, that um, it was not the actions of a, a truly brave and courageous uh, soldier. Uh, on the one hand, there was there's an argument that this was about um, uh, instilling a sense within Japanese troops of um, uh, the levels of violence that would be required uh, and ruthlessness that would be required to carry out these conquests and that uh, by uh, basically um, reducing the status of your opponent uh, to that of sort of potentially not human uh, uh, helped in that regard. Um, another thing that is important though I think is to um, is to remember that Japan like Germany here uh, was fighting to establish an empire, but until they had established that empire, they did not necessarily have the resources necessary to maintain and to fight during a long-term conflict. Uh, 
And for the Japanese, their industrial position was worse than the Germans in terms of being able to produce things like uh, field guns, artillery pieces, trucks, tanks, things like that. The, um, uh, the asset that the Japanese believed they had was that they had um, uh, uh, soldiers. Uh, and in particular, by creating in this Japanese army in particular, this idea that surrender uh, was not something that you did, uh, it allowed people to approach European POWs and others uh, with real ferocity, but it was also a way of maximizing the assets that Japan had. Uh, that is, to get people to fight in what at times could be very dire conditions, uh, to get them to understand or to, to sort of um, uh, refuse to contemplate uh, surrender was a way of basically ensuring that you would maximize all of your assets. That is, by treating surrender as so dishonorable and then treating those who did surrender uh, so poorly, what was being reinforced in the Japanese was, first of all, this idea that, that uh, yes, surrender uh, uh, made you sort of less of a human being, uh, but also by keeping Japanese troops from, from thinking about surrender, uh, it meant that they might fight past the point at which other forces uh, or other groups of soldiers uh, might have given up or might have sort of uh, conceded and surrendered. So by arguing that surrender was basically uh, not masculine, not worthy, not courageous, uh, what the and then enacting that on... Uh, European POWs, what the Japanese were also doing, what the Japanese military command was also doing, was reinforcing within their own soldiers this notion of how uh, bad uh, a surrender was. And it starts off, it creates a sort of vicious cycle because then, of course, once Japanese atrocities against uh, prisoners of war and others become known uh, throughout this theater, that then... Uh, means that uh, allied troops were very likely to, to uh, and as we'll see when we talk about the book by Eugene Sledge, uh, were very likely to try to, and at sometimes actually carry out, reprisals against cap captured Japanese soldiers. The notion that if Japanese soldiers would do something to American soldiers, American soldiers would respond uh, in kind and in a similar uh, way. This just continued then to sort of reinforce the idea uh, among the Japanese, that surrender was not only, you know, not something that you should do morally, uh, but it also created this idea that, that by surrendering you would be, in essence, uh, uh, treated this way by the Americans. One thing about, so this, this notion of um, uh, the, the sort of level of violence, the level of animosity, the level of atrocity at times, uh, I, in the Pacific theater and in the Asian theater uh, has to do at least somewhat uh, with the fact that you are dealing with a, um, it has to do with a lot of things, the climate, the environment in which people are fighting, the conditions, things like that. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the Americans in the South Pacific. But it also has to do with the fact that the Japanese, in trying to maximize their, uh, uh, their assets, especially their manpower, uh, had sort of created a system whereby surrender had been removed from all possible actions from a soldier. Uh, so that's one of the things to think about, that um, it's not necessarily done out of this idea of hatred of uh, people who are not Japanese, although there, there was some of that, especially towards other Asians, but rather uh, this... Um, uh, so treatment of those who surrendered was very much part of reinforcing among Japanese troops uh, a fear and a, and a, um, a, a hatred of surrender uh, so that they would fight beyond uh, capacities where others, uh, uh, other groups uh, might surrender. So I'm going to leave that uh, here. Now let's talk a little bit, starting in the next slide, uh, about uh, the treatment of other groups, especially of other groups of Asians by the Japanese, uh, and the effect that that had on relationships between the Japanese and indigenous people during the war. In addition to the violence that was carried out directly on groups like the Singapore Chinese, uh, 
The Japanese also exacted a great deal of what you might call economic violence and labor violence against populations throughout Southeast Asia. And I'm going to talk about a couple of ex examples uh, here. Uh, perhaps the, the, it's hard to describe which one is the, uh, the largest uh, a group because there were several. Uh, but just um, uh, a few remarks here about um, <coughs> the ways in which uh, the Japanese went about this. The Japanese viewed, like the Nazis did much of the Soviet Union, the Japanese viewed the, um, their possessions in Southeast Asia as places for resources. Natural resources, minerals, metals, uh, produce, and of course uh, human labor. <clears throat> By the uh, end of, the, of 1945, um, here are just some numbers uh, to go along with uh, this um, uh, uh, Japanese uh, occupation. Um, by the end of 1945, the Japanese had placed at least 7.5 million Koreans into forced labor. Uh, some in Korea, some having been moved to um, uh, Japan, uh, some having uh, been placed uh, in territory that Japan had taken in Manchuria, Manchuria, excuse me, um, on the border with the Soviet Union. Um, in fact, there were about fifty or sixty thousand ja uh, Koreans who were left by the Japanese in that area that was taken over by the Soviet Union in 1945. Um, and there's still a population there called called basically uh, the Sakhalin Koreans. Uh, who are Korea, people of Korean origin who, have, who grew up under the Soviet Union uh, because the Japanese did not repatriate these, uh, these people. Um, it's estimated uh, that at least uh, uh, 5 million or so Chinese, probably a lot more, but numbers are, are uh, varied, uh, were uh, placed into forced labor either in China itself or uh, were moved to um, uh, to Japan to work in things like mines uh, in southern Japan. You probably uh, also uh, had uh, the movement of about 200,000 women uh, who were called comfort women. Uh, you may have heard of these, uh, this practice, uh, but women who were basically uh, forced into sexual slavery to um, uh, work in brothels uh, that were placed in garrison towns around, or, or, or placed near uh, garrisons uh, that the Japanese army uh, established in China, uh, in the Philippines, um, uh, in Korea, uh, and elsewhere uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, at least 200,000 of them. Um, and really only in the last 30 years or so uh, did some of these women begin to come forward and press the Japanese uh, government uh, for some sort of reparations and recognition uh, and apology. Uh, that there had been this very concerted effort after the war uh, to, in essence, um, not talk about what had happened during the war, uh, with the result that many of these women sort of had lived marginal lives even within their own communities because of what had happened uh, to the war. Uh, and the Japanese government uh, resisted and, and still continues to resist uh, a lot of uh, outside demands for um, uh, uh, apologies, uh, especially for groups now with I'm going to, the, the word you see here is, is uh, romusha. Uh, that is the um, the, the word in uh, Indonesia uh, for people who were forced into labor there, particularly on the island of Java. Um, in Indonesia, you have uh, perhaps uh, the most significant uh, uh, enforcement of labor regulations, uh, the largest sort of per capita, uh, basically uh, forced labor, uh, of a certain population, um, and also at the same time, uh, a huge demand for resources. Uh, the Romusha, these people from Java uh, who were um, recruited, or sometimes they were promised wages, sometimes they were just simply forced into labor. Uh, no one's quite sure of the numbers, but it's at least four million people from Java, uh, many of whom uh, were placed into forced labor within Indonesia, 
uh, and then others of whom uh, were transported around. At least uh, half a million uh, went to, for example, work on a variety of railways, uh, a railway uh, in another part of Indonesia, and also that um, uh, famous uh, Burma uh, Thailand Railway, uh, where they worked alongside um, uh, British and Australian POWs. This exploitation, which by uh, 1944, 1945, uh, had not only uh, moved all of these people around under unbelievably harsh conditions, uh, but the expropriation of resources uh, of, of food uh, and uh, things like rice, in particular um, uh, wheat, uh, 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 cattle, anything uh, like that, uh, had led, started to lead to famine. That is, in uh, 1944, 1945, not only do you have famine in Java, as illustrated here, uh, but you've also started to get significant famine uh, in the Philippines. That as the Japanese fought to contain or to, to uh, basically, uh, as the Japanese fought against the American invasion of the Philippines, uh, they conducted a complete scorched earth campaign in which they tried to get rid of uh, a lot of resources uh, that um, uh, either uh, the American army uh, or Filipino civilians uh, would need with the idea of, again, sort of creating chaos, creating a humanitarian disaster uh, that might divert the Americans or that might at least slow up the advance of the Americans. So what you see here is that, that there's a growing realization in a lot of these places after uh, or, or after 1942 or so, uh, that the Japanese occupation is not what it sets out to be. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily a surprise, given what Japan uh, intended, uh, the ways in which the Japanese talked about themselves as being uh, the Yamato race that I believe I mentioned before, uh, the ways in which the Japanese understood uh, or believed that other Asian states, in essence, uh, existed to serve Japanese interests within this empire. Um, what is interesting is that the Japanese did in 43 and 44 begin to make more concrete promises of independence to uh, uh, groups in Indonesia uh, and in the Philippines, uh, but these were never actually uh, carried out. They were rather uh, the symptoms or the, uh, the last sort of uh, uh, actions of a Japanese empire which was uh, coming under enormous pressure. Uh, uh, in multiple directions or from multiple directions. I'm going to leave this lecture here. I'm going to make another shorter one uh, for uh, early next week dealing with um, some uh, indigenous uh, opposition to Japan uh, throughout uh, South and Southeast Asia. Uh, and then we're going to start looking at the American experience of fighting Japan in uh, the South Pacific. We've looked at sort of Southeast Asia as one theater. Now we're going to look at another area, the South Pacific, which is where the bulk of the combat uh, between the United States and uh, Japan, really the bulk of the combat in uh, the larger uh, war between the Allies and Japan uh, is focused. So I will leave that there. Uh, please do contact me again if you have any problems accessing this material or hearing any of this. Thanks.